seen-eyed dog? You now have a hearing ear kitten. Right now on Old Joe's Reminiscence. When the probe organization is hired to locate a lost gold mine, their top probe agent, Hugh Lockwood, uncovers danger, deceit, and a desperate foreign power that wants the lost mine for something other than its gold. Hugh O'Brien stars. to search episode number 11 that first aired on December 20th, 1972. Won't you join me as I reminisce? I warn you though, if you haven't seen the episode, you are in for spoilers as I dig deep into the gold machine. After seeing the teaser, I'm sure this is the one that I've been mentioning where Gloria Harding gets to climb out from behind her telemetry station and join Hugh Lockwood out in the field. Assuming that I'm not hallucinating, this has to be the one, because sadly, episode 11 marks the final appearance of the lovely Angel Tompkins as our favorite jealous telemetry specialist. I haven't seen the episode in 50 years, and this one, more than any other, seems to stick out in my mind. We get right into the action with authorities trying to dissuade a man who is threatening to jump from a building's rooftop. The jumper is Richard Quo, the executive director of Eurasian Jade and Metals Incorporated. Lockwood is joining co-star Burgess Meredith as VCR Cameron for a briefing on a very red-lit probe control set. I don't get it, Cam. The readout says he didn't die. That is correct. But that was a ten-story drop. They broke his fall with some new emergency gear, a mobile shock platform. Making his leap more like diving into a big fat pillow. The close-up photos they showed us of the jumper were of an Asian man. But when his parents conference in, they are obviously Caucasians wearing makeup to appear Asian. It's kind of cringeworthy, something they wouldn't try to get away with today. Mr. Chen Kuo is played by Herd Hatfield. He's a native New Yorker who had a long acting career spanning nearly five decades. Ironically, his first role in 1944 was as an Asian in the movie Dragon Seed. Mrs. Quo is played by Pittsburgh-born tennis star turned actress Marianne McCargo. Their son, Richard Quo, tried to take his own life because of his misappropriation of millions of dollars from the family business. Richard tried to take his life because our accountants have reported a misappropriation of a great deal of money from our family business. We know that Richard lost the money in stock speculation. It is gone. But there is a possible source of funds that may save us. Funds that are also missing. Which we want you to find. An old gold mine once owned by her grandfather. The maps, etc., were destroyed in the San Francisco earthquake. A man named Charles Eastland had tried to sell them a fake claim record. He died in prison. Well, we appreciate your confidence in probe. Lockwood thinks it's a ridiculous idea, and he makes it obvious that he doesn't want to be on this case. Mr. Lockwood is joking, of course. He is our finest probe, and he has never failed us. Yet. Ever. Cam mentions that Dr. Barnett assigned Lockwood to the case, but we don't see Ford Rainey in this episode. 
Lockwood says he wants Cam to arrange a flight to San Francisco. He also wants a deck of fresh credit cards and a chauffeured limousine. You're supposed to search for the gold, not roll it. Want to find the death certificate on Charles Eastland Forger? Right. That chauffeured limo, deck of credit cards? Well, they're just better tools to work with, my dear. I'm looking forward to it. I get the feeling you know something I don't know. As I have mentioned, Miss Gloria Harding is played by Angel Tompkins. <laughs> Angel Tompkins was born December 20, 1942. She is an American actress who has appeared in scores of television shows and films. She appeared in Playboy magazine. She is still active in the motion picture industry, with a film currently in pre-production. Lockwood kisses Gloria's forehead, and he jets off to San Francisco. Up and running. Reply to Probe 1 request for death certificate. Eastland, Charles M. Negative. Release on parole. May 9, 1971. Alive and well in San Francisco. His natural habitat seems to be more like Lower Market Street in the gutter. The next establishing shot of an office building says we're in San Francisco. When we cut to the interior shot, I recognize the first man we see. He's Carl August Speer, being played by Mark Leonard. Born Leonard Rosenson on October 15, 1924, Mark Leonard got the acting bug while in the Army. He studied theater at the University of Michigan and pursued a career as a stage actor in New York City. He made some television appearances in New York in the 1950s. A decade later he decided to give Hollywood a try. He took many small parts in film and television over his years as an actor. One of those was as the Romulan commander on the Balance of Terror episode of Star Trek in 1966. The role that brought him fame was as Ambassador Surik of Vulcan, a character introduced on the Journey to Babel episode of Star Trek in 1967. He returned to voice the role of Surik in the Yesteryear episode of Star Trek the Animated Series. He continued making guest appearances on television but he was a favorite of the Star Trek franchise. He played a Klingon captain in Star Trek the Motion Picture. He was brought back to play Surik many times. He appeared as Surik in Star Trek III The Search for Spock, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, and the Star Trek The Next Generation television series. Mark Leonard died on November 22, 1996. He arrives at San Francisco Airport in Flight 307. A limousine has been rented for him from the Carlisle Rental Service. The other man in the office is General Chu, played by Bill Fletcher, who was busy playing supporting roles in the television industry for three decades. Set the time clock for one half hour. Time it for 30 minutes. When Lockwood exits the airport, a man dressed in a chauffeur's uniform calls his name. Back at probe control, we hear that a replacement telemetry specialist has been ordered. That's news to Cameron. Gloria Harding stands up and starts gathering her things together. I take it that this pertains to you, Miss Harding? Yes, sir. My vacation time is stacked up, and my replacement is due any moment. I believe a replacement is reporting now. Arthur Burrell. Thank you, sir. Sit down. He's Arthur Burrell, played by David Gillum. Cameron should already know him, since he was the probe agent who was abducted in Episode 2, One of Our Probes is Missing. I read somewhere that Episode 11 was actually the second episode filmed and that episode two was third in the line, which would account for that inconsistency. Now I'm thinking I may have been better off watching these in production order. Then again, how did he go from being introduced as a telemetry specialist in one week and being an agent in the field the next? Now the only thing you have to watch out for are Lockwood's vital signs. He's 
learn to control the readouts on new white lies, but his adrenaline's a dead giveaway on the whoppers. Does he lie a lot? Let's just say his pulse races. Remember who got you the job. Hardy, over and out. Have a pleasant vacation, Miss Harding. I intend to. Goodbye, gang. I wonder if her vacation plans will take her to San Francisco. Will she, by some twist of fate, end up at the same hotel as Lockwood? Hmm. Back at the limo, Lockwood has the driver cruising around in the seedier parts of San Francisco. Caution on medical telemetry. The surfer is tensing up. All systems. Any particular address, sir? I'll let you know when I'm at. Moreau department came up with a possible address. 901A Claremont. And he advises against showing up there in a limo. It's a flop house. Head for Claremont Street. I don't think we're gonna make it. That feels like there's something wrong with the engine. Red light. Feels like it's gonna stall. Better pull over. Extreme reaction to chauffeur. Confirm. Brainwaves developing precious patterns. I don't get it, Lockwood. The driver seems to be falling apart. Why don't you wait in the car? There's a gas station on the corner. I'll have them take a look at it. Hey, what's going on here? What's wrong? Lockwood exits the vehicle and hits the deck just in the nick of time as the limousine explodes with a loud concussion that breaks windows in nearby buildings. Lockwood looks to be okay. But when Cam asks, there's no answer. Cam has everyone run system checks. Are we transmitting? Yes, sir. Green lights. Both ways. Since we've established that this was the second episode produced, maybe that's why he always drives his own Mercedes from now on in the series. Lockwood visits the boarding house in an attempt to locate Charles Eastland. Charles Eastland. The woman at her pink desk at the flop house is played by Thelma Pellish. She played many bit parts, a few each year, from the late 1950s until her death in 1983. She tells Lockwood that Eastland isn't there. He's not here. Lockwood's not hearing any of that, literally or figuratively. He uh, inherited a lot of money. 209. 209. Would you please write it? Mm. Now, the next scene struck me as kind of odd. Why is Lockwood calling the man's name through the door? Charles Eastland? Why not just knock and wait for someone to open the door? When he eventually does try the door, it opens. Mr. Eastland? Charles Eastland is sitting at a desk. Mr. Eastland? He's dead. Lockwood reports a homicide. That makes no sense to Burrell. Don't get it. Burrell's receiving the same readout I am. I've got two sets of brainwaves. Probe reported homicide. It's somewhere in back of Lockwood. 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 Looks like Mr. Eastland was reading poetry. Lockwood, there's someone in back of you. Things fall apart. Carl Spear eases the closet door open, and he sneaks up behind Lockwood. He grabs the book and bolts. Lockwood chases him, and they have a brief tussle in the hallway. Spear decides to skedaddle, leaving the book behind. Well, here's one for you. It was after this book. You don't kill a man over a book of poetry. Lockwood says he's beginning to hear static. Penetration tone up. Hey, whoa! Hey, hey, knock it off! Knock it off! I'm going to head back to the hotel. Buy 
Buy some eardrops and check in. Next, we see Lockwood in the hotel lobby carrying a small pharmacy bag. He asks the clerk to write down his room number, but he's interrupted by someone tapping on his shoulder. Now, we saw his reaction when Laura Day did that in episode 10. Here, he's a lot less volatile. It's all been taken care of. The penthouse suite across the hall from Miss Harding. How did she get there so fast? And have uh, room service sent up a psychiatrist. I'm having an hallucination, and I don't want it to stop. I use my medical clearance to flank on my way here to help you. I can see your lips moving, but I, uh, I do not copy. Well, you've heard of a uh, seen eye dog. You now have a hearing ear kitten. What? What you see is what you get. The two share a passionate kiss in the hotel lobby, one that causes Lockwood to drop his bag of eardrops on the floor. She must be some fantastic kisser. We've never seen him react like that before, and he's kissed a lot of women in his travels. Ah, that made me feel a lot better. But he still can't hear a thing. Gloria indicates that she's hungry. Lockwood suggests room service. That's not what she had in mind. She wants a night on the town. After all, Lockwood has a deck of credit cards at his disposal. Lockwood and Harding go dancing. It's driving Cam mad. You have to tell me when the music stops. Got to get through one. Corona, try the sonar. We hear the sonar ping sound effect typically used in old World War II submarine movies. You are in the presence of people. If you hear even the faintest peep, send us a signal. Breakthrough. We've made contact. All right, everybody, calm down. Let's get cracking. This book has something to do with the missing gold mine. Swell. Now he's going to get blessed. The man who killed Charles Eastland tried to steal it. Lockwood, wouldn't it be a matter of courtesy to tell her you've regained your hearing? I need your help. We have to find a phone booth. There's one out by the powder room. enjoying this scene where Lockwood pretends that he still can't hear, just so he can watch Gloria make a fool of herself. Just how long can he keep it up, though? They locate a phone booth, and Lockwood checks the yellow pages. You've really got a thing for books. Durant. Bless you. Rare books. Believe me, your rare book is nothing compared to a medium well girl. Nine West Cambridge. You hear that, team? We're gonna go browse in a bookstore. Murdoch, stick to your console. You're way ahead. I was thinking, they're out late night dancing. What bookstore is going to be open this late? They take a taxi, and when they arrive at the bookstore, Lockwood seems surprised to discover that it's closed. He rings the bell anyway. As they share a kiss in front of the shop's door, we see a bearded man peer through the window pane from behind the closed sign. Mr. Horant, my name is Hugh Lockwood. I'd like to have you meet uh, my associate, Miss Gloria Harding. Monsieur the sign. Go associate someplace else. <laughs> I like this guy. He's Ruben Horant, played by Kurt Kasnar. Kurt Kasnar was born Kurt Searwitcher on August 13th. 1913 in Austria. He came to America with a theatrical production in the 1930s. He was drafted in 1941 and the army trained him as a cinematographer. After the war, he concentrated on performing in Broadway plays. 
He made the transition to Hollywood, appearing in films since 1951 and on TV a few years later. He made dozens of TV appearances over the years. He played Alexander Fitzhugh in all 51 episodes of Irwin Allen's Land of the Giants. Kurt Kastner died of cancer on August 6, 1979. Lockwood says it's an emergency. Emergency. It's about a rare book I'd like you to look at. No books, it's too late. Come back tomorrow. Harant's temperament changes when he sees the book in Lockwood's hands. I didn't know you had this book. Come in. Please associate. Come inside, please. He says that book is worth a lot of money. He sold it for 30000 would you uh, be willing to buy it back for 30000 At this point, Gloria Harding suddenly realizes that Lockwood can hear. Lockwood? Shh, I'm negotiating. How long have you been able I'll to... I'll explain it to you later. Mom, Mr. Harath, would you be willing to buy it back for 30000 No. Why not? It's worthless. He tells a story of an old man who bought the book more than 15 years ago in exchange for his service. Whoever brought the book back would be given a map. He then says he doesn't have the map. He's playing a little game. He makes the couple guess what might have happened to it. He didn't lose it. He didn't give it away. He didn't sell it. They give up, and he starts to explain the plan in detail as he starts cutting open the book's cover, wherein he had sealed the map. They now have the map. I think the next scene would have fit better into the story a little bit earlier. We see Spear, who appears to have just returned from his encounter with Lockwood. Your orders were to get the book. Lockwood is a trained fighter. This can't be happening after 1 a.m., and I don't think they would have waited until the next morning to have this discussion. My brother tells me that probe agents are not permitted to fight. Oh, really? We've seen Lockwood and the other probes hold their own against many adversaries, knocking them out using a karate chop. I also think that Spear ran away without giving him much of a fight. Well, he hit me like a linebacker. He's a black belt. He's got to be. All he did with the chauffeur was hold him by the shirt. Lockwood must not find the Timberline Mine. Lockwood decides to look for the mine from the air. He rents a helicopter. If this episode had been shown earlier in the season, we wouldn't have been quite as surprised to learn that Hugh Lockwood knows how to fly a helicopter when we saw him take control of one in the Adonis file. Now there's a lot of flying around with little to no dialogue. Was there a writer's strike? Near the end of a full minute of music-backed flight, I noticed that at least one of the exterior shots clearly shows a woman sitting in the right seat. And now that I think about it, they must have reused the footage from this during the Adonis file. At least it looks familiar. That means they needed to have a Harding look-alike in the helicopter's right seat to maintain continuity. While they're flying, Cam contacts Lockwood to tell him they're tracking them by a ComSat antenna. We've got you monitored for air search of Mountain Sector. Prepare to patch in all the flight recon photos of Diablo Range. They're spotted from the ground. Take out his tail rotor. It's all over. He takes a shot and Lockwood has his hands full trying to control the chopper for nearly a minute and a half while he finds a place to land. That's a lot of flying. Next, they set out on horseback. Cam informs Lockwood that the chopper's drive shaft was grazed by a bullet. A quarter inch more and the torque would have torn you to pieces. Well, thanks a lot for the good news, Cam. If it gets too hairy, we want you to scrub the mission. It was too hairy back when the limousine blew up. The closer they get to the mine, the greater their danger. According to Cam, that uh, toboggan ride we took in the helicopter was caused by a bullet. They're probably still around. To me, Hugh O'Brien looks more natural dressed in denim 
than he does in a fancy suit. I used to dress exactly like that when I was in high school. I don't want to sound like a chicken, but there's nothing in woman's life that says a girl can't be scared out of her britches. You just come on over here and cuddle up real close where it's nice and safe. <laughs> They run to their horses and they hightail it out of there. Their armed adversaries mount their horses too. After a while, Lockwood calls for their unnamed guide, played by a stuntman, Dean Smith, to hold up. Before he can even say anything, Gloria Harding is climbing onto Lockwood's horse behind him. She must have known that he was going to suggest that they split up and have the guide take two of the horses back to lure the gunman on. I'll follow you. We're not going to the mine. Can you think of a safer place? Oh, my mother. It's dark when they approach the mine. Lockwood asks Cam to guide them in using infrared. You heard him, Corona? They come upon a man with a rifle. Hey, you stay here. Don't you move until I come and get you. Lockwood sneaks up and surprises the man. His gun goes off, they struggle, and Lockwood's scanner goes kerplu. Lockwood, vital signs fading. Did Lockwood get yet another concussion? He got the other guy first, though. He's back in the bushes. I tied him up. How do you feel, Lockwood? Horrible. Your guide ran into the forest rangers. They caught the man who shot up your chopper. He was also your chauffeur. Well, it's time they approach the mine. Lockwood makes a few observations. There's no gold in this mine. It's worked out and worked out for years. I certainly wouldn't expect to find any gold near the entrance. Lockwood's intuition tells him to have the probe control team set his scanner to check for free electrons. Uranium. Yes. Uranium. The general sends the probe agents deep into the mine. Mr. Quo sees what's happening, and he tackles Lockwood from behind. The general crouches behind a mining car. Gloria takes shelter behind another mining car. When Lockwood knocks Mr. Quo to the ground, it gives the general a clear shot. Gloria has had just about enough of this. She pushes her mining car down the rails. It crashes into his, pinning him. Lockwood hurries over to knock the guy out with a quick karate chop. Don't. Don't what? Don't ask me if I'm all right. Because I won't be until you and I have a nice long vacation in San Francisco. That sounds good. Almost too good to be true. There's nothing on the assignment takes about a vacation in San Francisco. Now, Lockwood, Miss Harding, you are not, I repeat, not authorized to use the company credit card. Activity not authorized. Repeat, not authorized. Cam, if you think our present activity isn't authorized, we just better save you from the activities we have planned for the very near future. Ta-ta. Well, that was fun. This episode proved me right about there being one that featured Gloria Harding joining Lockwood in the field. And don't you just love it when Hugh Lockwood solves the case and gets the girl? If you like this review, please hit the like button. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, consider subscribing to my channel. Many thanks to those of you who have already subscribed. That means a lot to me. Don't forget to activate the notification bell. That way you'll know when I post my next video. Until then, save it!